Monaco, one of the sport's most iconic venues, the jewel in the F1 crown, and maybe the most challenging racetrack on the calendar. We've piled into the second smallest country in the world for one of the most glamorous events in all of sport and the stage for the eighth race weekend of our biggest season yet. Hello and welcome to Weekend Warm Up. And welcome here to the beautiful marina in Monaco. Welcome to Lawrence Bretto, Julian Palmer and Will Buxton. And chaps, we are in Monaco. We can already hear the roar of engines in the distance. We've had plenty going on here on Media Thursday. Lawrence, how are you doing? I love Monaco. I know it's a bit quirky. I know everything takes longer to do. But like, is there a better vista than this to have as a background for, for the Grand Prix weekend? Jolian, an iconic circuit, isn't it? Yeah, I'm buzzed to be here. It's just so great. And people can say what they like about the Grand Prix. It's difficult on Sunday to overtake. It can be a little bit uh, of a procession. But the event is just amazing. I'm so excited for all the, all the driving action through tomorrow and qualifying Saturday. Uh, qualifying Saturday is something else. Well, I remember you and I were like kids at Christmas watching that one. How are you feeling to be back in the Principality? Yeah, I love it here. Anytime you get even slightly or feel maybe slightly jaded about anything in life just stand trackside here and watch the cars hurtle you, you never get closer to the cars they never feel more dangerous and scary as they do around this place like if they if they proposed this race now 100 you, you'd get laughed out of the room it's in, it's insane I was reading a stat earlier that it would take 12 seconds for a Formula One car to cross Monaco from France to Italy. Wow. Oh, wow. That's how small this place is and how much we have packed into well, it. How fast our cars. Well, like, well, precisely, absolutely. Um, it is time for our Imola 60 second recap. Is it you, Lawrence? It is me. Now your yeah. voice has returned back to full, <laughs> full health, full fitness. Um, over to you. Imola, 60 seconds, let's go. Okay, well, Max Verstappen started on pole, Lando Norris was P2, and Lando actually gave it a really good go, trying to take the fight to Max in the run down to the first corner. Further back, it was less good for Alex Albon, he had a bit of a pit stop issue. He pulled out, he thought it was okay, but as he went out on track, he realised that one of the tyres hadn't been bolted on perfectly. Elsewhere, it wasn't so good for the other Red Bull, of Sergio Perez, he was off track. Lewis Hamilton had an off-track excursion as well. Further back, Yuki Tsunoda was having a great race. Started inside the top 10, managed to hold on to get a point. But further up in the closing stages of the race, after Charles Leclerc looked like he was going to put some pressure on Lando, he went across the chicane and then it became all about the battle between Max Verstappen and Lando Norris for the victory. Lando started hunting him down. It was within the last couple of laps that he managed to get within DRS, but there wasn't quite enough time for him to catch Max and put on the put on the fight for the win and that meant that Max won, Lando was second, Charles Leclerc was there to the delight of the Tifosi, um, well, Oscar Piastri was P4, yep. uh, who was P5, Carlos Sainz P5. P5 and two Mercedes, you can see only got that final point, Lance Stroll fought in his way into P9 as well. Great stuff. Lawrence Barretto, thank you very much indeed. An altogether different challenge this weekend for all of our drivers and indeed for Red Bull as well. Will, you spoke to them earlier. Yep. What is the feeling here? Because what we saw in Imola was Lando Norris chasing Max Verstappen down to within seven tenths, our closest marginal season. Will that continue here? Well, what I, what I love is that for the last two seasons, every driver that isn't racing for Red Bull has wanted another car. In Imola, Lando wanted another lap or two it's getting closer and i was talking to checo earlier i said you know we're used to turning up at tracks and it's a foregone conclusion you guys are going to take pole and you're going to win it's not that way now is it and he said absolutely not and it's not just mclaren it's ferrari as well they've upgraded that car the data says that we expect them to be competitive here possibly the team to beat around this track we've got three teams who have all got the chance to win not saying that they are going to but They've got the opportunity and I think we're in for a really exciting second, what is it, two thirds of the season. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jolien as well, this is a track that absolutely does not forgive. You cannot make a mistake on here. You will be punished. How much will that be playing into the minds of the Red Bull drivers knowing, yes, they are the team to beat, but the targets on their backs, the gap is closer than ever, it seems. Yeah, uh, but that's part of the fun. That's why we love it here, because it is just nuts to drive. It's the most bonkers thing and you have to push the limits. Max did it last year in qualifying. It was one of the most exquisite last parts of the lap I've ever seen and you will ever find. But then Checo did it in qualifying and found the barriers at turn one and it completely binned his, his weekend. That is Monaco in a nutshell. And what I like about the situation we've got now is that the Rebels don't have the luxury. They didn't last year, honestly, either here. And if you imagine now, 
some of those teams, McLaren and Ferrari particularly, have closed the gap. They're going to have to use everything, a little bit like Max did in Imola, to, to win it. There's, there's no uh, resting place for anyone now. It's the very epitome of risk versus reward. Actually on Sergio Perez as well. You've written a column this week, F1 Unlocked. If you haven't already, do sign up. It's free. You get all manner of content, including Julian Palmer's wonderful educated thoughts. Um, on this being a bit of a turning point for Sergio Perez, he's on a bit of a knife edge, isn't he? He has to perform here, you feel? I think, it's, I think he's in a big moment. The uh, driver market's in full flow right now. We've had a few Alex Albon sign with Williams, which was someone that was being mooted around, even though he had one year more on his, on his contract. But there's still things happening. Carlos Sainz is a major player here. Um, and Sergio Perez is without contract at the end of next year. Now, in, earlier in the season, I think it was pretty safe that he was, well, he was looking more assured to stay. He was doing a good job, was second in, in three of the first four races. But as McLaren and Ferrari got closer, their upgrades have brought performance to the car. They're now nipping at the heels and maybe have the best car in race trim. You could say that about McLaren. Um, and with that, the gap, if you have three tenths between Max and Checo, was first and second, it's now first and fifth, first and sixth, seventh, eighth for Checo in Imola. It's not enough to guarantee Red Bull a constructor's title at this stage. That's how far the other teams have progressed. And this circuit is such a good one for Checo in the past. Podiums, a race win here. He needs to come and bounce back because now is the time that, uh, that a lot of these deals are, are happening. Carlos needs to secure his future. Various other drivers in the mix as well are, are speaking and that Red Bull seat's still up for grabs. I just feel like Checo has to perform and this is either a sort of win or last year bin for him. <laughs> Win or bin. Let's make a button for that for our F1 live coverage. Will, this is so often a confidence track, isn't it? You need to fully back yourself to perform on the limit around Monaco. McLaren will be backing themselves right now, won't they? What have you made of their performance in the last couple of race weekends with these upgrades bolted on now both cars? Yeah, look, stunning. Uh, absolutely stunning. The interesting thing this weekend, though, is McLaren have stated all the way through the year that it's the slow speed corners where they don't necessarily feel as strong, and yet they always seem to do really well on the circuits where they're expecting to do really badly. And given that they expect to do really badly, well, not really badly here, but struggle here comparatively, it's going to be another strong weekend for them, isn't it? Because that's just the way That's just the way it goes. Also, the last time that the team all lost their bags on the way to a Grand Prix was yeah. Miami and, and none of their bags turned up this weekend. So, And they haven't even finished building the motorhome. So um, I know. an inauspicious start, shall we say, for, for McLaren. But uh, look, they have a very competitive car now. It has been massively upgraded. Ferrari too slapped on a raft of upgrades last time out. It didn't really work out for them as they'd hoped. But... All of these incremental games are moving them ever closer to Red Bull. And as Jolyn said, in race trim, the Red Bull is no longer the absolute guaranteed fastest car weekend to weekend. Well, earlier on, I uh, caught up with Lando Norris to get his thoughts ahead of this Monaco weekend. Here we are in Monaco. Some pretty uh, tricky weather today, but uh -huh. it looks set fair for the weekend. Do you believe the McLaren will be the fastest car on track this weekend? Can you beat no those Red Bulls? <laughs> I have no idea. It's such a different track to what we've had all season. Um, no one can say whether we're going to be uh, the best or not. Uh, I think we have a car that's competitive and up there and, and fighting with Red Bull and Ferrari like we've shown over the last few weekends. But um, anything can happen in Monaco. So we just kind of keep our head down as normal. We work as hard as we can and uh, that's all I ask for. With the confidence from the last two races as well coming into this weekend, how do you approach one in which qualifying is so important and this is a confidence track? Um, I mean, there's certain things with, with the balance of the car that you require maybe a little bit more from, a bit more of a predictable car, but at the same time, when you get to Q3, maybe you don't want that. You want that car that's a little bit more on edge, a little bit more risky, but delivers a bit more lap time if you put it together. So a lot of it's about driver preference and that kind of thing. And you learn through the weekend in the sessions what you want from the car and, and what the appropriate level of risk is. But that's Monaco. That's always the, the challenge you have here. Is, is how far do you want to push it until something maybe goes wrong. Um, but it's always exciting and so with the weather, it's going to rain maybe the next few days. So that's probably going to be the bigger question. Well, good to hear from Lando and you can see how much it would mean to him to get a win here. His face literally lit up. As I said, imagine winning Monaco. Um, Oscar Piastri has been trying to find some Monegasque heritage as well. <laughs> I think Charles Leclerc may have adopted him, adding to Oli Behrman and Leo Leclerc, uh, that gorgeous little puppy he has as his two children so far. <laughs> it's really odd. Anyway, um, you also saw in that interview as well, of course, that they are decked out in the full Senna tribute. The new livery on the car for this weekend and 
and the colours as well, Lawrence. You uh, went to that event last night, didn't you? Yeah, McLaren have gone full send with this livery. They've done a full wrap of the car. They've gone for the colours of Ayrton Senna's helmet. And the idea is that they want to mark a celebration of Ayrton's life. Um, he won here six times, five times in a row. And I think for them, they just want to use the Monaco weekend as an opportunity to really celebrate him. Um, and yeah, Oscar's obviously delighted with the colours because they're the Australian colours. So he's yeah. particularly <laughs> happy with his race suit. But yeah, just something a little bit different for McLaren. Obviously, last time... They had a different livery. It was last year they had a triple crown livery. It didn't quite go so well. They both got lapped. But obviously <laughs> in 2021, they had the golf livery and Oscar, uh, Lando got the podium. So it could go either way. Interestingly, the team won't be using different overalls in the pit lane. And there is a little bit of orange left on the car on the wheel fairings. And that's because, as we were talking about, confidence here is key. Knowledge of your car is key. And they're so used to looking to the wheels and seeing those little flashes of orange that they need that as their as their sighters, as their as their markers, and also to make sure they stop in the right in the right pit box. They're not going to change the mechanics overalls to something else so they get lost. I've actually I've actually done that before when Got lost. I know we changed we changed the the uh, the overalls and it was all just suddenly so dark. Star Wars overalls. And no, 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 that was me. Um, that was I think it was in Bahrain, one of the first races of the season, or maybe the first one, and everyone was in black overalls. I just was like, I don't know which one I'm going. For. <laughs> it can be tricky. You get so used to to aiming. Um, I love the look of the McLaren colours. I love it. It's the centre tribute, which is you know always a, a poignant thing, particularly 30 years after his death. But I just Regardless of that, I think it looks such, such a good Formula One car. Great, I might be great. biased towards a yellow car, but <laughs> <laughs> I think it looks great. And there were people that wanted it to be like the 80s livery, you know, the classic the, red and white. Yeah, the red and but white. What's interesting with McLaren's car this year is that actually the colour blocks, whether it's been papaya and, and carbon, or as it is this weekend, the green, the yellow and the blue, if you reference it back to the car from the 80s, it's exactly the same design, oh. but just with different colours being used rather than red and white. Lovely, lovely stuff. Um, well, from McLaren to Ferrari, McLaren's getting the better of Ferrari last time out in Imola, but we did have a Ferrari on the podium. Charles Leclerc, Lawrence, here in Monaco. It is a story, isn't it, over the years? He's seen highs and devastating lows here, hasn't he? How do you think he will fare for this weekend? Yeah, he's seen far too many lows for his, for his standards and obviously came very close twice, started on pole, couldn't start on pole here. This is his best chance yet, really, for a Grand Prix when the Ferrari, will mention slightly earlier, I think it's 0 0.006 seconds quicker than the Red Bull based on simulations around here. I think they've always gone well in recent years around here. That Ferrari car, Carlos Sainz, came close to winning around here. So I think they're in really good shape. What's unfortunate for them is that McLaren are performing really well, that Red Bull obviously within the mix, and it, you've got to get everything right. But look, Charles really found a, a turn of pace in qualifying again. It seems like he's back on it. He's got the confidence in the car just around about the right time to get around here because qualifying obviously is so important. Julian, can I ask you as, uh, as a driver, the pressure of performing on home soil, but also the pressure of performing on a track like Monaco on home soil. It almost sort of doubles it in a sense, doesn't it? Yeah, well, m pressure of performing in Monaco is big for everyone. And then it's Charles' home race. But he's actually been so fast here in the past as well. It's not through a lack of pace or an understanding of the streets. It's circumstances, the, the crash that he had, the rain that fell. There's various things that have stopped him. He's my early tip for, for victory this weekend. I think the Ferrari car here is going to be really strong. They're struggling a little bit for straight line speed. You don't need a lot of straight line <laughs> speed around this place. And that was there. Without that in that deficit in Imola, they'd be right there as well. And on top of that, Charles, home race. This is going to be where he buries his demons. It's going to be the fight for pole on Saturday, ultimately, that could decide this race. And we've got three teams incredibly closely matched. We saw it last year. I thought qualifying last year was one of the most exciting things I've seen in 20 plus incredible. years of, of covering the sport. It was just brilliant. Every single lap across the line, Alonso, Ocon, and that <laughs> lap Ocon. from Verstappen, which didn't start brilliantly and even pinged the wall on the run to the line. It was just, it was, it was mesmerizing. But there's a 50% chance of rain going into qualifying on Saturday as well. So, you throw that into the mix, you throw trying to take every millimetre on this track, every advantage that you can, three teams incredibly closely matched. I can't wait for Saturday afternoon. A chance of rain yeah, Saturday. Big I was we, seeing, we saw it today. I was seeing 10, 20%. I didn't realise it was yeah, that high. Yeah, up. we have, as you can see from the ground here, we've had a lot of rain today come down and a huge thunder and lightning storm as well. Um, Charles Leclerc has moved up to P2 in the driver's standings. Let's take a look at how that championship is shaping up. 
Max Verstappen leads the way on 161 points. Charles Leclerc, as mentioned, moves up to P2. Sergio Perez in P3. Lando Norris goes ahead of Carlos Sainz in to P4. Yuki Tsunoda still in there in the top 10 for VCARB. Further down, Oli Behrman still in the mix. Nico Hulkenberg, Daniel Ricciardo, Esteban Ocon and Kevin Magnussen all scoring points so far with Alex Albon, Joe, Pierre Gasly, Valtteri Bottas and Logan Sargent yet to score. So that is how the Drivers' Championship is looking as we head into our eighth race weekend here. Uh, Carlos Sainz, other side of the garage, Jolene, he didn't seem particularly happy in Imola, whether it was the setup of the car or it, perhaps even the, the sort of team dynamic. I wasn't quite sure what was going on for him there in some of the post-race show comments he made. Um, where do you see him fitting in for this weekend? How do you see him going? Oh, I think he'll be competitive as well because I think Ferrari will be competitive. But it's also a big weekend for Carlos, like I said, for, for Checo, for the driver market. And he was such a star in the early rounds. Imola's never been a great circuit for him. Um, I think he, he can be strong here again. And he, he needs to be there nipping with, uh, with Charlotte, trying to take a pole. And absolutely, he'll, he'll be reset from last week and, and be gunning it here. So we think science is still in the running for that Mercedes seat. There's so much chatter, isn't there? So many rumours no. about where people are. I think it's very, 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 very slim. I think at the minute right. they would like Max or they would like Kimi. And I think if either of those two don't work out, then maybe Carlos comes back in. But by then, I think he'll have had to decide what he wants to do. You've just gone, no. <laughs> well, no. Look, I said from the outset, from when, when Lewis signed for Ferrari, um, that I, I believed Mercedes would do all they could to get Antonelli in the seat. Mm -hmm. I stand by that. Max is a massive long shot for them. Um, trying to grab him away from Red Bull, I still don't think it's all that likely that they will. Um, whether Max will still be at Red Bull in 26 is, is the big question, but 25, I, more, as time goes on, I, more and more I, I see him staying here now, um, despite everything that, that, that is going on here. Um, I don't, I don't see Mercedes as a possibility for Carlos. I, re, I, re, and I, and I talked to him today about, you know, where does he go and, and his decision making because we hear that Audi want a decision out of him quickly um, and if he doesn't make the decision then, then they'll shift their focus to somebody else. And I said, and he said, you know, look, I'm, I'm not putting any pressure on myself. I'm not giving myself any deadlines. And I said, oh, yeah, okay, you might not be, but what about other teams? Are they giving you deadlines because we hear this and that? And he goes, you hear lots, but I'm the only one that actually knows what's going on behind the scenes. <laughs> Trust me, I know what's going down. I can take my time. And we were talking about this on the drive in this morning, Joe, and you think that's a really strong suit for Carlos to actually have that confidence in himself, to back himself to take the time. I love it. I, I think he's doing a really sensible thing right now. Too many drivers are taking an easy option, in my opinion, of locking themselves in for a few years with a team that's not performing right now and isn't going to be performing probably next year, maybe into 26, and they're locked away in those seats. And Carlos obviously is locked out of Ferrari, but that doesn't mean that he can't just buy this time. He's, he's a driver that most teams would be really keen to sign. Maybe any team would be. And so I like the fact that he's just sounding things out and he's looking for performance over a nice paycheck and a cushy life. I love it. It's the, it's the competitor in him. And I think he's more likely to go to Red Bull than Mercedes, as it stands. I don't know if he'll end up at either or Audi, but I think Red Bull's is, is strongest shot. We'll keep a keen eye on the driver market and let's hear that interview with Carlos Sainz now. The simulations for this weekend, however much we want to read into that, seemingly have Ferrari um, up the front and as favourites for this weekend, certainly over one lap, thus giving you control uh, for the race on Sunday. Do you believe that you guys are the team to beat this weekend with the new package on board? How competitive do you believe you will be here in Monaco? Um, seeing it from a very honest perspective, I think any of the top teams right now can, can win Monaco. I think... Monaco is such a special weekend, such a special track that it just requires a bit of a better outlap, a clean qualifying lap for you to become the the Monaco race winner. No, so um, I think between Red Bull, McLaren, and us, I think we're going to be very tight, or we start this weekend in equal terms. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be all about who adapts their car better to to these streets. Low speed hasn't been our strength this year, so. I'm a bit more cautious on, on that front. Qualifying lap hasn't been our strength this, this year, and we know how important is Monaco. That's why maybe lowering expectations is it's a bit my job now after the question you've asked me. But this doesn't mean that we, we're not targeting a win. I think we, we are targeting to, to win here this weekend, and we're going to do everything we can to, 
to try to nail the out lap, try to nail the Q3 lap and nail the strategy in the race. So it remains to be seen where Carlos Sainz may end up, Mercedes perhaps not, or otherwise, I'm sure he'll be on the grid there in 2025. Talking of Mercedes here in Monaco, earlier on I had a chat with Lewis. Uh, he was very much saying, we still don't quite know where this car is for this weekend, and obviously Monaco is different in characteristic to many of the tracks we've visited so far, but he seems more optimistic about this car than the previous two years they've been coming. So Monaco, where do you see Mercedes slotting into that pecking order for this weekend, Lawrence? I think at the moment they're P4, P4, P5, just depending on how well they kind of get things out of the car. But what I would say is generally the vibe within that team is that they are making incremental steps forward. They're, they're not the kind of steps that we've seen with McLaren and with Ferrari, and obviously that is irritating for them. But I do feel like they do think that they are making progress with the package they've got. Lewis and George talking today are definitely happier than they've been in recent times. I think Lewis even said that you know the car, this car is better than the other yeah. two cars, and I don't know what he called them, the Evil Sisters, etc. <laughs> but this car is better. The problem is that everyone else is just doing a better job than Mercedes. What can they do around here? It's going to be tough because qualifying has been a bit of an Achilles heel, specifically for Lewis of late. So it might be a tougher weekend for him, but um, they'll obviously they'll just see what they can get out of it. Well, a team on the up, very much so, is V-Carb. Yuki Tsunoda scoring points, a huge haul for both drivers from Miami. Will, what have you made of V-Carb so far this season? And, and Yuki's performance, certainly, he's outperforming Daniel, isn't he, at the moment? He's, he's leaving him way, way behind him. You know, Daniel's gone back to looking like the, the guy at McLaren that we, that we really, really didn't recognise. OK, he had that, that great moment. In, uh, in Miami, but that's the one highlight of what otherwise has been a, a disappointing year. There's no other way of saying it. Yuki's had a great season. The V-Carb is good. They're developing it well. Looks solid out there. And when you cons consider that the season started off with five very clear teams in the top 10 and points looking difficult for everybody to score, V-Carb have done a, done a brilliant job of taking them where and when they can. And after that really weird moment, after the checkered flag in Bahrain, where he kind of went to sideswipe Daniel, Yuki's been a completely different driver. He's got his head straight, got himself together, racing beautifully. He's mature and calm on the radio. Different driver, like different gravy this year. I think he's been fantastic. And I can't imagine there wouldn't be a seat for him at VCARB next year. But if he does end up losing it, there's going to be a lot of teams that are going to be after Yuki as, as well. He'll be a big player in the market. I just, I can't see them getting rid of him at the moment. His racecraft, you're right. It's, it's, it's poised, it's mature, it's patient. Jolien, are VCARB going to be looking over their shoulders to Haas and the likes of Alpine and then Williams and Sauber who are yet to score? Are they actually looking ahead? <laughs> yeah. Because they're, not, they're, that, they're, they're not that far behind Aston Martin. I didn't think we'd be saying that yeah. coming into this year. Or Mercedes. Uh, well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I would have, I would have liked to see a race in Imola where Yuki's not passed at the start by Nico Hulkenberg, and he can actually have a straight fight and see how close he can stay with the Mercedes. We know Mercedes are in a little bit of a no man's land, but Sonoda was right there on pace mm -hmm. the whole weekend with those Mercedes. Got out qualified by them, and then they're just struggling to get off the line at the moment. So if they can get the start sorted and not lose places, especially in Imola where it's difficult to overtake, especially here where it's even harder to overtake, mm -hmm. but. They're ahead of, of the rest of the bunch, and Aston Martin, for me, is a major concern. Well, his teammate Daniel Ricciardo has won around this incredible circuit, and Lawrence Barreto chatted with him earlier. Daniel, obviously, it feels like you're coming into kind of form on a qualifying perspective over the last couple of events. How are you feeling coming to here to Monaco, where you've had so much success and where qualifying is so important? Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm still... <laughs> I look back, like, I still wish consistently the qualifying had been better this year, but... As you say, it's we're starting to look uh, more racy, you know, and that's that's good. So um, this is a place where, yeah, things can things can get pretty exciting. Uh, I missed it last year, like so. I'm, firstly, I'm just really happy to, you know, the thought of just driving an F1 car around here tomorrow. That's enough to get get me feeling all giddy. Uh, and then, yeah, part two of that is, yeah, you start to visualise. Uh, the perfect lap around here and you know that a perfect lap around here can maybe jump you a few extra spots up the grid so the thought of that as well is, is exciting so we'll see on one hand trying to contain my excitement but I'm also not not going to hide it you know obviously as I said I missed last year here so really happy to have a chance again. Yeah, don't, definitely don't contain it too, too, too much. Uh, your form's obviously turning around in a positive function. Have you been chatting to Laurent, to Peter, to Christian, to Helmut about next year? Because that's what the driver market's kind of full in full swing at the minute. Not yet. Uh, you know, I think I 
although the season now is looking better than the first few races, it's still, I know that there's still more to come from me, at, so at least more consistently. Yes, I, like Miami was a outstanding half a weekend. Uh, so I know I can do it, but it's now trying to do that obviously more often, as I say, just to perform at a high level more consistently. I think that's, that's what I still want to be showing and I haven't showed enough of. Um, but yeah, so focus on those things first, focus on what I got to do and, uh, and then we'll see where, where the wind takes us. <laughs> Oh, there are just so many moving parts in this driver market. Daniel Ricciardo in the mix as well. Both seats at Alpine are also up for grabs. Pierre Gasly and Esteban Ocon. Ocon's been linked with Haas. I'm seeing that now increasingly becoming, becoming clear. Mick Schumacher is being linked with Alpine. What do you make of that? Yep, so he's on their list. He's at the bottom of their list. But he's not at the top. <laughs> How long's the list? How long's the list? He's on that list. I think they're looking at three or four drivers. Am I on the list? You're not on the list. <laughs> I don't even I'm sorry. List. So you're below Mick Schumacher. I'm really sorry. Tough. Um, they are. They're considering all I options. I know Jack Doohan <laughs> is on the list as well because I think they do want to try and promote their academy and promote that the academy's working. I think they're very much aware that Pierre Gasly and Esteban Ocon are, <laughs> are basically talking to anyone who's got a free seat. Ocon, like you said, is in demand at Haas. He's got an option potentially at Audi. He's got an option potentially at Williams. So obviously Alpine have to look at all of their options and see what else is, is possible. But I think it's quite exciting that, you know, Jack could get a chance there if things get get mixed up because look, he's done a great job. I know we'll lose him as a, a, a guest, uh, as a, as a co-host on our show, but it'll be yes. quite cool to see him out on track. <laughs> mixed emotions there for us, Will. <laughs> yeah, we'll lose yeah, yeah. our co-host, but he gets an F1 drive. I'm not, I don't know how to feel. Um, Ocon, a podium here last year yeah. i mean the one for alpine um for ocon of the season it was some lap for him in those conditions as well wasn't it quali was amazing for ocon last year absolutely sensational and look you know we've we've talked alpine down a lot this year and rightly so because the start of the season was hideous for them but if you look at their rate of progression and where they find themselves to have even scored a point so far this year i think is an astonishing job from them and shows what's being done behind the scenes and you know, again, it's a, it, they're having to rebuild this team. They seem to have to do it every 18 months to two years, but they're going through another rebuild process. So, yeah, to have scored points already, I think a phenomenal job from them. I agree with you guys. Um, Gasly and, and Ocon are both looking elsewhere because why wouldn't you with the team in the state that it's in at the moment? Haas, I think, want a race-winning driver to go alongside Oli Behrman in, in the other seat next year. Gasly and Ocon would have to be high on their list, list for that. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be a difficult weekend uh, for them here. Uh, around this around this lap. The car is still nowhere near where they need it to be. And crucially, the drivers don't have confidence in it. And this is a confidence circuit. Pierre Gasly saying to me, though, that absolutely anything can happen in Monaco. <laughs> <laughs> Take a drink of water or otherwise every time you hear that for this weekend. Moving on to Aston Martin, a really difficult weekend for Fernando Alonso, both, I think, in Miami and Imola. Obviously, with the upgrades on, though, he was just driving that car you know he was almost trying to outdrive the car he wasn't getting the performance from it he expected he ran it like a test session so when they qualified as far back as as they did they put on every compound attire they used soft the medium and the hard during the grand prix they literally used it as a test that's all it was so it was fernando alonso's worst finishing position in formula one history but he wasn't racing it was a it was a test session for him but it shows how bad the correlation is between what they're doing in the factory and what they're putting on track but here, last year, Fernando Alonso lit up the streets of Monaco with those qualifying laps against Max Verstappen. And then equally in the race, you feel he could have won, Jolien. Can they pull something out the bag here? Look, anything can anything happen in Monaco. Happen. Here you go. Drink. Can they? Uh, well, they're not going to win the race. Right. Well, obviously, no, I mean, with the yeah. caveat that anything can happen. <laughs> um, I mean, it is a place where drivers make the difference. Ocon did it last year for Alpine. Fernando did it as well, really, with, with Aston Martin. I think they can certainly score points, but I just have the question mark on how they, their development is so bad. They can do a great job with the time and, and a good few months to try and make a new car, a new direction with a concept change, that, which they did last year. They've added to it over the winter to sort of cement their position fourth or fifth. But as everyone else can improve and they have the baseline they can work on, Aston Martin have brought upgrades the last couple of races and they're just scratching their heads. I think the peak performance they say is there, but the car becomes harder to drive. You see Fernando, who doesn't make a lot of mistakes, making more mistakes. And it's one thing seeing the numbers. You've got to put the lap time on the board, and, and that's what they're not seeing. Stroll picking up points last time out, as you said earlier in your recap, Lawrence, but work to do at Aston Martin. I spoke to Fernando Alonso. 
you enjoyed a superb battle with Max Verstappen here last year, coming very close to the win. Where is the Aston Martin now, though? What are the expectations? We'll see. I think Monaco is a very unique venue, and uh, anything can happen, to be honest here. You need to uh, start FP1 with a car that gives you that uh, confidence to really uh, be able to push in qualifying that extra. Um, it's a unique weekend. You go in qualifying at the speeds that you've never been in, in any of the free practice. So it's a little bit this un unknown that uh, it brings a lot of adrenaline. So, yeah, I love this weekend. Maybe Sunday is a little bit boring. Yes, I accept that. But uh, up until Sunday is, is probably the best weekend of the year. So let's see. Last weekend I know is super tricky for you and for Aston Martin. What were you able to learn, though, from the car, from the upgrades to bring, not just to this weekend, as you say, it's a slightly different one, but for the rest of the season? Yeah, we learned a lot. I think the new package gave us uh, the expectation in terms of um, improvement on the car, but uh, not yet the balance that we wish, you know, behind the wheel. So we're still fighting a little bit with the balance of the car, but uh, we have a few ideas on setup and also on development. It's only race 8 of 24, so it's a long championship and uh, we will get better. OK, on to Haas. And on a circuit in which one lap performance is so important, Haas have been looking pretty decent over one lap, certainly on Nico Hülkenberg's side of the garage. Will, what do you make of his chances? I mean, it's Hülkenberg in a Haas and it's 2024. Top 10 is, is pretty much your expectation every weekend you come into. If they get it right and they have a nice, clean couple of practice sessions, why not? He could find himself well in the mix and gunning for points here because, as we know, it's hard to overtake during the Grand Prix. Pretty optimistic for him. Kev, don't know where his head is at the moment, really. Um, I, I don't know quite what he's what he's doing in terms of where he's looking for next year either. He doesn't really have management with him at race weekends. If he's hanging on for that Haas seat, he's going to be left out in the cold and we're going to lose going to lose Kevin Magnussen. But he's got to try and be careful as well around here. He's a couple of points away from a race ban, so he's got to keep his head got to drive sensibly we know kev can pull out great laps around here we look back a couple of years ago here he was what was it p6 uh on the grid so kev can do the business around here for Haas. but hulkenberg yeah he's just been been metronomic in qualifying hasn't he yeah he has great stuff um jolie moving on to sauber they look decent all right in the slow speed stuff at imola will that play, play to their advantage here do you think It'll help them. Uh, I think they're probably a little bit too far adrift. I think Valtteri's a chance to try and qualify well and get in the top 10. I think Joe's been a bit disappointing for me so far this season. He's been left behind his teammate. Um, they've got a, a still a little bit too much work to do, I'd say. But maybe Valtteri to, to have a good qualifying. Yeah, and both drivers will be looking for a seat for 2025 as well. Um, Bottas has been linked to Williams, hasn't he? Whether that comes to fruition, we'll wait and see, as many of the rumours continue to swirl. But Williams will be looking to bounce back, won't they, from a disappointing weekend in Imola. We're saying that quite a lot about the team at the moment, aren't we? Obviously, Alex Albon with that issue, um, the wheel not on the car correctly, and then ultimately the DNF. And Logan Sargent also fighting for his seat. Yeah, Williams have kind of built themselves a bit of an all-rounder. The problem is it, it doesn't have the peaks that they got last year, which was generating the points that actually ultimately made their campaign last year. You know, they're getting lots of 12s, 13s, 14s, and then just not getting those highs. So I think coming to Monaco, they're going to have to hope for opportunities, and they're going to have to hope for something to happen within a Grand Prix to have any chance, really, of fighting for points. You mentioned Logan. Look, he said this morning that James has said it's up to him to prove that he can keep a seat. But I think you're right in that they are chasing Valtteri hard. I think Valtteri's got a pick between Williams and Hassel where he wants to go. They've got so many options, Ocon, Gasly. They know for the first time in many years, Williams have a choice of which drivers they want and drivers want to go to them. So I think that speaks volumes about where the team is going. But right now and this weekend, I think it is going to be a difficult one for them. All right, well, let's take a look at how the schedule shapes up for this weekend here in Monaco. Friday, free practice one will be on air at 1.15, building up to our hour of running before FP2, 4.45 p.m. Moving to Saturday, free practice three. Our coverage begins at 12.15, and then we build up to the most important hour of qualifying of this season, our pre-qualifying show and that fight for pole beginning at 3.30 p.m. Sunday, race day, we will be beginning our pre-race show at 2 p.m. ahead of a 3 p.m. Monaco Grand Prix race start. Okay, chaps, let's do this then. Predictions, please, and final thoughts ahead of the Monaco Grand Prix. Who'd like to go first? Go on then. Um, <laughs> Lando Norris for the win in, oh! the, in the Senna liveried McLaren oh. um, with Charles Leclerc P2 oh, and, breaking hearts. and Carlos Sainz P3. What happens to Max? I don't know. <laughs> Good stuff, Jolian. 
Leclerc, I'm going to stick to my guns, takes the win. Nice. Max second, Norris third. Hopefully a close fight between them all. Lovely. Um, I think it's going to be a battle between the Ferraris to the win. So I think Leclerc to win, Carlos second. Uh, and I think Lando's going to get the final podium. I'm not sure also, like, Will, what's going to happen to Max, <laughs> but I just feel like the Ferraris are going to be in the fight to, to win this thing this weekend. And I think there's something about Lando at the minute. He's kind of got the bit between his teeth. Yes. Cue the Max Verstappen win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to predict a Charles Leclerc win on home soil in Monaco because I love a fairy tale ending. I'm going to say a Max Verstappen P2 and a Lando Norris P3. Same as me. That's it. Yeah. Oh, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Great minds. <laughs> weren't listening. I was listening. I <laughs> Max, P3. Uh, same, no. uh, P2. That's okay. We're allowed the same. Yeah. Great minds think alike, Joe. Two people Thank can be you. right. Okay, let's wrap the show. Uh, well, that is it from the weekend warm up here in Monaco. Thank you to Lawrence, to Jolien, to Will. Uh, we will be back for FP1 tomorrow, Friday, here on one of the most iconic circuits and locations in all of world sport. We'll see you then. Bye bye. Welcome to Monaco. My home race.